Namaste, dear learners, and once again, welcome to the classroom of National Institute of Open Schooling. Today, we are going to have a little explanation on chapter 25 of Senior Secondary Biology course. It's about natural resources and their conservation. Let's try to understand what does a natural resource mean. If we go by the dictionary, what does a resource mean? A resource is a substance or a material that you and I can use for our benefit, right? So a natural resource is something which is available, it's a resource which is available to us naturally. It can be a source or it can be a supply which is available to us in the nature which can be used in a beneficial manner by us and that's called a resource. Now a little question and thought for you all learners. Think of what all resources you have already used or say you usually use in a day during the day of 24 hours. Going by the current trend I can say you use a lot of electricity, you use the mobile phones which I have here as well, television, computers, but then there are other things as well like the newspaper or a book that you may have used, the food that you may have eaten, the water as well. Now if I may ask you to think of a resource, like these are things that you have used and maybe you are not using right now or you are using some form of technology because you are looking at this, this, this talk between you and me, but now think of a resource that you are using constantly at all points in time and without which it's very difficult for you to survive. Think, think. Yeah? Got it? Yes. It's the air. It's the air that you and I are using practically every minute. Not just minute, perhaps every second. And if we don't get air, we cannot survive. So all the resources like air, water, sunlight, the soil where we grow our food, the minerals which come to us in our foods or some of our drugs contain the minerals. These are all the resources that nature has given us and they are natural resources. We use them every day but perhaps we do not use them in a defined manner and we call them as natural resources, isn't it? And it would be so difficult to live our lives if these natural resources were not available to us. So this is the theme and the focus of today's chapter, which is natural resources. Now, if these resources, say the air and the water is available to us, there's a question. The question is, are there some things which nature has not given us, but we have created? Yes. So for that matter, you know, electricity was not there in nature. We have created it using natural resources. So as also written in your textbooks, when you think of a resource that you are using for your own benefit, they can be categorized into two subdivisions. There are some resources which we have received from the nature. We just talked about them. But there are equally good number of resources that human beings have created for themselves, for their own use, luxury and comfort. So, Two categories, resources, there are natural resources and there are human made resources. If we need to look at those resources further, the natural resources are also of two types. There are some resources which may get exhausted or over or completely used at some point in time. That point in time could be today or it could be thousand years later. And a very common example that you have been listening to is petroleum. You know, we say please use petroleum and petroleum products in a wise manner. We have the stock today underneath the ground. We may not have these stock tomorrow. They may not last maybe all human life. So such resources which are provided to us by nature but which may get exhausted at some point in time are exhaustible resources. But then there are things around us like the air or the sun that rises every day. So the solar energy, the wind, the air, 
all the energy contained in the oceans and seas which bring the tidal movement. This energy gets replenished practically every 24 hours. So they are inexhaustible. They may not get over by our use. We may not exhaust them by using them. The day they get exhausted, maybe there may not be any life on earth. So these resources provided by nature are categorized as inexhaustible. So I repeat, we said there are natural resources and there are human made resources. Within the natural resources, there are things and resources which may get over at some point in time. So they are called exhaustible, but there are some which will go on as long as there is life on the earth and we call them inexhaustible. Within exhaustible also, some resources can be renewed like the forests. Forests are exhaustible. So if we, if we use them at a pace that they cannot be regenerated, we can actually exhaust them. But forests have a tendency to renew themselves. So if you, we cut trees, the trees, you know, come up again. But there is coal, there is iron or there are even species provided uh, by nature to us. If we use them in a manner that they get killed today, they may never generate. And you know, you read in the newspapers very often that so many species in this world are getting extinct because we kill them and when their number comes down to such small level that they cannot reproduce anymore and can have a viable population, their new ones generated, then they get died, isn't it? So there are, so if we want to study natural resources, these are a very basic level at which we can categorize them, we can classify them. And remember, this chart is there in, 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 the, in the textbook. So that was uh, definition and how scientifically we categorize natural resources. The chapter also, the title of the chapter also has another term which is called conservation. Conservation means to, to use something in a wise manner so that it is protected and it remains with us for a long time. But the question is that if humans are able to generate our own resources like the electricity, um, then why do we need to conserve natural resources? So what happens if tomorrow there is no sunlight? We can use electricity 24 hours a day. We use it in the night hours. So we can use it later on as well, isn't it? But there's a very significant and a very important fact which will convince you I am already convinced, which will convince you that we need to conserve the natural resources. The fact, dear students, is that all our lifestyle, which you can see the three circles there, which fits into the social part of that circle. So all our lifestyles, the way you and I live, the food we eat, the way we interact with each other, the activities that we do at home as well as all those activities which are innermost, the economic activities which help generate money for us. Now money was not a resource provided by nature. We have created monetary resources. So all the money that we earn, all the industries and factories that run on this earth today, from where we get our own products, from where we even generate electricity. So even a power plant is a part of the economic and social circle there in the diagram that you are seeing in those three circles. Ultimately, anything that goes on in the innermost circle and the middle circle comes out of the outermost circle, which is the environment. So if we need electricity, we would need either coal or we would need water, isn't it? To generate electricity, we have thermal power plants, and we have hydro power, hydro power plants as well. Now, where does the coal and the water come from? It's a, remember in that chart, it's a part of the natural resource, not human made resource. So all human made resources ultimately come from the natural resources. So if there is no natural resource left, how will we generate our own resources? And that's the reason, dear learners, that we need to conserve natural resources. Fine. I am not sure whether you are convinced, but I think you understand that the outermost circle, only when that is protected, the inner circles are also healthy and protected. 
Now, if that's the case, let's look at some of the key natural resources and what's happening to them today. We'll take them one by one. Now, as I said, look, let's look at those three circles. The economic growth that we are, we are fueling because we are talking about GDP and we are talking about which country is developing more, which country is creating more money, brings benefit to some people. And some people lose in that process, isn't it? So, out of an industry or out of an economic activity, there are a lot of people who get the profit, but there are some people also who are losing it. So, for example, if there is a thermal power plant, you and I are perhaps getting benefit out of it, sitting in cities and using the electricity because it supplies electricity to us. But there is somebody down there, maybe in central belt of India, where coal is being mined. The people who lived in those forests where we are doing mining, they are losing because their houses are gone, their habitat is gone. They used to live on the forest and the forests are gone because mining is happening. So whenever there is an economic growth, some people gain and some people lose. That's a fact. And that creates a lot of development problems. So we, we listen about communities being pushed out of forests, dams being built and communities and forests getting submerged. There are those kinds of problems that happen. But at the same time, economic growth also brings a lot of environmental pollution and environmental degradation. Now, who suffers out of this degradation? It is usually the poor which get affected the most because people who can buy clean water would buy clean water. But poor people, if they cannot pay for the water supply, if they were dependent on a clean river or a waterfall or a clean lake which has got polluted due to mining or industrial development, they lose their water supply. They have only two options left, either buy water which they cannot or drink and use water which is polluted, which is unhealthy for them. So again, it's the poor which is getting affected. And ultimately, we think today we can buy water, but ultimately our generations may not be able to buy water because there may not be any clean water left on this earth. So today we may think that it's the poor who are getting affected, but when it comes to environmental and natural resource degradation, Learners, please remember, ultimately everyone will get affected out of it and therefore the need to conserve our natural resources. Now, why we are talking about conservation is that we have already seen the three circles and that the outermost circle is life for everybody, not just for us but also the factories. They are the lifeline for the factories as well. So if we need to live in a dignified manner, we need to conserve resources. And the first natural resource that we are going to look at is soil. Do you know what soil means? You know, we have been reading it on and off. It's actually the topmost layer that we see on the land, which is very important. So when you, you see the topmost layer, we call that as the soil resource, which is a natural resource. And it is imperative that we conserve it. Why do we conserve it? Now, if you look at the PowerPoint, the slide which is being shown there, you will realize that soil has great depth. You know, it, it moves from one layer to other one. The deepest layer that you are seeing on the slide, which is called the bedrock, that is originally how the soil would have been. From that layer, the bedrock, to reach the topmost layer, which is O or the organic humus, this whole depth of the soil that has got generated, it makes thousands of years. So due to forces of nature, the bedrocks due to water, wind, variation in temperature, the big rocks become smaller. And over a period of time, which is thousands of years, these smaller rocks, they accumulate, they get a lot of organic material into them and ultimately they form the topmost layer of the soil. Now dear learners, imagine. If that little one millimeter to one centimeter of the topmost layer of soil is washed, it is not conserved, nature's effort of almost thousand years is lost. 
So do you realize how serious soil conservation can be? Why that soil is needed? Of course, it's needed for you and me to grow our food. But it's also needed for other species. As you would see on the slide, there are number of organisms which live in this soil. There are microbes, bacteria, there are earthworms, there are other kinds of worms as well for whom this soil is their home, it's their habitat. So isn't it good to have everyone live the way they, nature has made them to live? Why should we take away somebody's home and habitat from them? So there are two very clear reasons. One is a very selfish reason to save soil, that if we have no soil, we won't be able to grow our food. But there is equally sensitive and ethical reason to protect soil because there are a lot of other organisms which are dependent on this very thin topmost layer of the land which is called soil. So soil as a natural resource needs to be conserved. What's happening with the soil today? This typical picture that I'm showing you there, you would, you would see it many times when you are driving on the highway, you're, you're going into a natural area, the hillside, the roadsides on the highways, and this is exactly what we are doing to the soil today. Can you see the roots of the trees are completely exposed? It's because the soil has been washed away from that area. And not a small patch, but you can see how deep those roots are, that whole depth of the soil is washed away. Why does it get washed away? There are two reasons again. There are natural reasons because soil making and soil breaking is natural process, but a very slow process as, as I said that it takes thousands of years. But if, we, if, get, if it gets washed in a day or a month or few years, the thousands of years of soil is lost. Why that is happening at this fast pace is the second reason, which are the human made reasons. Like, Let's look at these two reasons in detail. In terms of the natural processes, there is the flow of water which washes soil. So if a river flows by the hills and comes down to the lower hills and then to the plains, the river obviously brings a lot of silt with it because it washes and breaks the rocks and washes the soil and the silt there. So the flow of water in nature washes away soil. Similarly, when there is strong wind that blows, or if there are storms and volcanic activities, they also disturb the topmost layer of the soil and it gets eroded. And then there are other calamities. Sometimes there are earthquakes and that can also disrupt. If, if, it's, if it's at a very high rate that earth, pace that earthquake has happened, it can disrupt the soil as well. Now these are natural processes. And if you would see, their pace is almost very slow. You don't get volcanoes erupted every year or every day or every month for that reason. So nature has created a balance between formation of the soil and erosion of the soil and the two are completely in balance with each other. So every time the soil is getting washed, there is some new soil being formed at some other place. Let's look at the human made reasons of soil erosion. We are cutting down forests for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we want to build our homes. Sometimes we want to build factories there. Sometimes we want to build roads through a forest. Now, it's the trees which hold the soil in their roots. The minute large number of trees, hectares and hectares of forests are cleared, this soil becomes loose. And any time the monsoon happens or even the smallest rainfall happens, the soil, huge amount of soil gets washed. Urbanization, well, they are connected. We are clearing forests to establish our cities. When we establish cities, we need roads, we need houses, we need tall buildings to accommodate our offices. For all of that, we are clearing the natural grasslands and the forest, again leading to soil erosion. We also clear large number of grasslands to build agricultural lands there. We create farms as we call them and we remove the natural grasslands. Now in farmlands, there's a huge difference between a grassland and a farmland. A natural grassland has grasses, but it also has a lot of other species of trees and life forms. But when we grow wheat or rice or bajra or maize there, we don't allow anything else to grow but the wheat or the maize or the bajra. You see the difference? Because in a grassland, so many species are living. They, they get their habitat there. Their niches are created there. But agriculture, 
are usually one crop. They are monocrop areas. And therefore, all the variety of the life forms get lost. And the way soil was being used and was being bound by the grasses and other trees, it also gets eroded and the quality of the soil gets affected due to agricultural practices. Last but not the least, we also take our animals to grazing. When we have the cattle, we have the sheep, they go out for grazing. And the, if, if they are grazing in smaller numbers, you know the grass regenerates itself. But when there are huge number of animals, then the, the pace at which the grass gets eroded is so high that it's likely to lose the soil. Okay, we have looked at the, uh, you know, the reasons why soil erosion is happening. Well, what can be done about it? Few things. At least people like you and us can plant more trees. Hopefully, it will save some soil at some point in time. And we can adopt for better farming practices. By that, we mean if we, are, if we live on the slope of a hill, you know, we can create counters on that hill. Otherwise, when we grow the crops there, the hilly terrain is slopey. And whenever there is rain, immediately the soil gets washed off. Or we can create a little terrace like the staircase on the slope of the hill so that when the water falls, it stays on that terrace and doesn't take away all the soil with it. The soil gets retained on those terraces. Those kinds of practices can help prevent soil erosion. Similarly, when we take our herds out for grazing, we can have controlled grazing. So, yes, all creatures like to graze in, in a natural environment. We can leave them open for a certain point in time in a certain patch. And once the patch, the grass is over there, it may help to move them to another patch so that this patch of grass can regenerate. Or it may also be compensated by stall feeding. So we can get grass and feed them in their stalls, feed the livestock in their stalls instead of leave, leaving them open all the time. So remember, soil extremely precious for you, me and large number of thousands of creatures living in that soil. Natural and human made reason leading to soil erosion. Humans can, you know, look back into their own actions to ensure that soil is conserved. With this, the part of this chapter, which is conserving our natural resources, is over. We will come back to you very soon looking at some more natural resources. And trust me, it is going to be very interesting because the next resource in, the next chapter, in this chapter that we will talk about is water. And while you may not be able to connect to soil so easily, water is something that no one can stay without. So, thank you so much and see you soon.